What's up, guys? What's going on? I'm Paul. This is Pauline Theology's Daily Devo with Trust in Jesus Ministries. And we are going through the story of uh, Jacob. And now we are on this struggle. We're on this strife, man, between the, the wives. After he's married, we saw that uh, Leah was giving birth to all these kids. And now we're about to find out um, something about Rachel. She's a little angry. She's a little angry. So if you hadn't checked it out, go ahead and read. See what it has to say. Stop the tape. Come back once you're done reading, and we'll go over the four questions. If you've already read it, let's go ahead and dive deep. We're in Genesis chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. So what's uh, the scripture actually saying? Well, it says that uh, Rachel was jealous, man, when she saw that her womb was uh, closed, that she couldn't bear any children. And so she goes up to Jacob, man. She's like, give me children, Jacob, or I'm going to die. She's like, man, I got to have some kids. Husband, give me some kids. Now, we know it ain't, it ain't his fault because he's been having kids with Leah. She's just angry. She don't even know what to do, man. And so she goes to the one who uh, she thinks could do something, which is, is a good thing, man. It's her husband, man. She wants to confide and talk with and be uh, um, open and honest with her husband, man. And so that's that's a, that's a wonderful thing. And I think that's a relationship thing that we should have is that we should be honest with each other and we should go to each other. But she, they did get a little they did get a little feisty with each other because Jacob's like, look here, woman. He was like, man, it is not. Uh, is Am I in the place of God? Am I God to have closed your womb? Am I God that you're not bearing fruit from your womb? Is it is it my fault is what he's saying. So I don't suggest that the relationship be that way <laughs> uh, because that could cause some strife in the marital status. But I do think that it's good that they are going back and forth, talking to each other. Anyway, after that, she's like, man, I'll give you my um, slave girl so that you can produce for me a house uh, that I can build my house children upon upon her. And so she does. She gives it to him and he takes him and uh, they have kids. Now, this is a normal thing. We saw that it happened with Sarah and uh, uh, and uh, her, uh, uh, sheesh. Woo, I'm fumbling my words. I can't think of a uh, old girl's name, but it um, starts with an H, though. But, yeah, we see it happen with Sarah and Hagar. And now it's happening again here. I think this is a custom that happens that the slave girl produces sons and those sons are hers or the wives. Anyway, so when that happens, they have a child uh, with Bilha and the first child comes out and um, Rachel says she's vindicated or she's justified. Uh, I got a whole thing about vindication and justification because it's a dynamic between James and Paul later on, and the same word means both. One means to be made righteous before God, and the other one also means to be shown to be righteous. Uh, and this one's the one to be shown to be not exactly righteous, but to be shown to be whatever needs to be shown. And that's what vindication means. And so in this word, she says, because this son has uh, appeared, then that means God has proven that her um, desire to give Bilhah to Jacob is what was needed so that she could have a child, so that she could bear a house because her desire was to want a house, which means kids, uh, male specifically, and it happened. And so that's what was supposed to happen. And uh, so the Dan is what she names him because Dan uh means uh, vindicated or justified. And then uh, another child uh, pops up and she calls him Naphtali because uh, she says she struggled a great struggle with her sister and she has prevailed. And this is um, quite the thing because the word for great here or huge or monumentous is Elohim. Um, and I was reading in some commentaries and they're talking about how Elohim is never just used as a secular or a, um, a non-sacred word. And so 
in this instance, uh, it could be one thing. First off, it could be like, man, I have fought a godlike struggle with my sister. And so that's why it's, you, it says a great or a, a magnificent or a huge struggle of wrestling is because uh, she's comparing the stature of her wrestling to the majesty and the power of God, that it's a godlike struggle. This is huge. But some also think that she might subtly, or maybe she's just saying, saying more than she actually knows, is that her struggle is with God and not with her sister. A little application here sometimes I got to drop in, uh, even though it's not application time, is that, man, sometimes, man, we be struggling with folks. Sometimes we be, be struggling with people. Sometimes we be struggling with situations and circumstances. But really, our struggle is with God because we're asking the question, why? We're asking the question, why me? Why this? What's going on? Is it? And, and, and the, the question of why it comes down to, to God and, it's, and his sovereignty. And so when we see all these things going on and we think that it's a, against another person or against a situation or a circumstance, maybe we should turn to God and ask the question why or just ask the question what? Like, what do I do? How do I handle this, God? And that's what it means to trust in Jesus. That's what it means to trust in the sovereign one is to go to him because and then know that whatever happens is going to make you look like God, because that is uh, the thing. It's going to make us look more like Jesus to walk the way that we were supposed to walk initially when Adam fell. That's what all these strokes and these stripes are supposed to do. That's the simple answer. I know. But uh, when we trust in him, even in the simple answers, we can find the, the truth and we can find the hope and we can find the peace and the comfort because we do trust in him. Anyway, so she says this great struggle I've overcome, man. And so she named him Naphtali. Now, what does this say about God? Well, I kind of um, talked about it a little bit and I said that it shows the sovereignty of God. God is in control. Of, of everything uh, that struggle she's struggling with could be a struggle. Uh, I mean, it is a struggle with God because even um, Jacob mentioned that he says, am I in the place of God to have, uh, to uh, have ceased or stopped or hindered the fruit of your womb? It's like, because he recognizes that God is sovereign in this. God is sovereign. He is the one in control of all things. That is a, a picture that we see throughout the entire scriptures. We see through Genesis as we've been reading, but it's clear here in the fact that uh, Jacob names it. And then you can't really see it in the English. You have to look in the Hebrew to kind of to, to look at it and understand it this way. But her struggle might be with God. What's it say about man? Well, I think we need to recognize the control of God in all these situations. Um, uh, and I think that that's what Rachel does do in, in a way whenever she finally, when she says in the end that, um, that God has heard my cry. God has, has heard my, my voice and he has vindicated me. And so I have given this child Dan is that she recognized God is the one who opens and closes wombs. She's probably still sad that it's not her own, but She's happy in the sense that God has allowed her to have a child through someone else. But also Jacob recognizes it. He sees God in these things and he knows that there's no other way that um, a child could be born through Rachel's womb, save for the fact that God opens it. And he's the one that gives the fruit from which her uh, womb would have. And how do we apply these truths to our lives? Well, the question is, where are you at with God's sovereignty? Where are you at in recognizing um, God's control over your life? He is in control. And sometimes we feel like we're rolling off the tracks and stuff. But that's where that trust and that faith comes into play. That's where reading all of these things that we've been reading and seeing all of this faithfulness that we've been seeing through the scriptures that's where we got to take hold of that. 
that's when we see all the things that God has done in our lives. As we read the scriptures, we compare it and see it in our own lives to open our eyes to see what he is doing and how he was doing it so that we can hold on to those things because those things are what builds trust in him, builds faithfulness in him, our faithfulness in him, because he is trustworthy and he is faithful. So let me ask you this question to finish it off. What is our desire? Is it the things that we want or is it the things of God? And I mention this is because Rachel says that if she doesn't have kids, she's going to die. She will die. Is our desire greater than allowing God to have control, to have God actually be sovereign in our life. Examine your life, and I'll examine mine as well. And I'll see you in the next episode.